So uh, exam two is over. Uh, most of you did extremely well, very uh, proud, pleased. Um, I'm like a proud mama who's seeing the grades come up from last exam. Um, you, you knew where to focus and how to study and you, do, you did it. And even with having three courses, most of you, y'all did well. So good job, very good job, very pleased. So we're week seven now, uh, exam two is over. And this week you have discussion question five, the case study, which I will make sure that it's open. Thank you, Mackenzie. And uh, the dosage calculation um, in Calculate with Confidence, the pediatric portion um, is due. So those are the things that are due. I will be getting these grades out finalized by usually Friday night or Saturday morning. Uh, we do have the exam running up till five o'clock on Friday. So the earliest it would be up would be Friday afternoon. I think the grades are pretty well set with what I'm giving you, maybe one question. I think most of it was very clear. So um, good job, everybody. So this week, we don't have a PowerPoint. What I'm going to do is give you a cahoots. I have really carefully looked at the cahoots, looked at the concepts in it, and know that I can describe them while I'm doing the cahoots. So, but if anybody wants me to do a PowerPoint with them, not a problem. I can go over that too. And then we can record that for other students, but it's up to you. I know that a lot of this information you're also covering in MedSurge 2, but it doesn't mean that you're understanding it for MedSurge 2, depending on your professor. And I realize that. So um, just let me know what you need and I can do that for you. So I know that you were studying for your exams. I know probably most of you didn't even have a chance to look at the interactive PowerPoint or just trying to look through it right now very quickly. And it's understandable. But now it's going to be to catch up, trying to catch up with this um, information. We're going over cerebral, which carries a lot of information and it's a big chapter and endocrine. Um, I have gone through it, looked at it. I believe I have 45 um, different questions. So I'm going to run a little over time today. But if you need to go because you have kids to pick up, whatever, it's okay. Um, I understand that. So who else wants to play? I'm driving home, so is it okay if I play along? You can drive. That's all I want you to do is drive. Okay, yeah, I'm almost home, but I had to go home for my mom's. Not a problem. No, Thank please you. take care of the road. Please be safe. Thank this you. Is number one. All right, I'm just going to get going and let's talk about what's going on in these things here. Growth hormone is administered by which root? Now, the growth hormone is produced by the pituitary gland. And sometimes children, according to their height and weight and the measurements every time in the doctor's offices are very small. And parents decide, let me give them a boost. You just get off. So it is a spontaneous injection that they get um, depending on the child, once a week, once a day. Um, and they do growth hormones up to the point where they stop growing. So they could start at age 12 and go to age 14 at that pre-adolescent where they basically stop growing and they're grown within their pre-adolescence. And the children can grow a couple more inches. It's better than being four foot two. You could be four foot nine. It's a lot of a difference. Highest priority for a patient diagnosed with a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So antidiuretic means against urination, right? Retaining fluid. Inappropriate means you're really retaining fluids. So the biggest thing we watch with this syndrome is intake and output. And if we're retaining fluids, we're going to watch our fluid intake. We're going to watch salt. These are things we would do if we had this syndrome. 
which of the following are signs and symptoms of an inappropriate antidiuretic hormone? So after that explanation, what do you think is one of the signs you would see? Inappropriate antidiuretic, anti, you know, urinating, anti being able to get rid of fluids hormone. And you'll see um, the signs that you're going to see is a decreased urine output because it's retaining it. If you're not diuresing, you're retaining. So it's just looking at those words and determining what these diagnoses mean. So polypropofil and methanazole are used to treat. Now, these are two medications that we use for problems with the thyroid. Now, we can have hypothyroidism. We can have hyperthyroidism. These are the ones that we use for hyperthyroidism. Now, when we look at these medications, some of the teaching that needs to be done is polythiocyl, it's also called PTU, which I like to call it, is a medication that can cause fevers and sore throat, neutropenia. So um, if this child is placed on that because of too much thyroid hormone, they need to call their doctor if they're seeing these signs and symptoms, okay? So one of the teachings. What is important to cover when teaching the family about this PTU, polypriothracil? I just said it. So again, if they're on this medication, their risk for leukopenia, which is sore throats, fevers, usually common signs, we would call the um, healthcare provider and let them know and see what they wanted to do for us. And Ashley is on fire. A single sign of diabetes insipidus is what? The initial sign, DI. It is something to do with the posterior pituitary gland. It's a hormone that's secreted. And this is thirsty and urinating. Your body just is thirsty. You drink, 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 and you urinate, urinate, urinate. In infants, they, you can keep giving them bottles of formula, bottles of formula, bottles of breast milk, doesn't matter. And they will continually to cry. They're hungry, hungry, hungry because they're in DI. But give them a bottle of water and they're satisfied. And that's when you know, hmm, this is possibly diabetes insipidus. A multi-select. What are the clinical manifestations of juvenile hypothyroidism. Well, whether you're adult or children, the symptoms are the same, except one. Because when we have children, children, you know, they still have to grow up to be adults. And that's the only difference between them. I mean, cold intolerance, that dry skin, constipation, um, you're not going to see weight loss or weight gain that much. They say with hypothyroid, I'm a little pudgy because my thyroid doesn't work. I've heard that a lot. Or I'm really skinny because my thyroid's working too fast. But the big thing with children is that decreased growth because they don't get enough hormone. They're not going to be tall. It's part of what happens with thyroid and not having it. Remember, hypothyroidism, we usually give synthroid level thyroxine. And to make sure that whatever that child was placed on, they continue. You can't change generic with this one from trade to generic. It must be gone through the physician. Why? There's some sort of little something in it that is slightly different. A child is a simple febrile seizure. What education would you provide for the parents? Well, we've talked about febrile seizures a little bit, and we know that Febrile seizures are due to a rapid raise in the temperature from no temperature to 101 in 20 minutes, right? And 
The thing with febrile seizures is that when they have a seizure, it's just to keep them safe. Turn them on their side. If they are in the hospital, you would pad the rails. Um, and you would, if they vomit, you would help clear that area. And you would know how long did it act? You know, how long was that seizure going on? Simple, those febrile seizures, they usually grow out of them. Usually they're six months to six years. After six years, they usually grow out of the seizures. I know my daughter-in-law carries a thermometer around and she takes my grandson's children's temperature, I don't know how many times a day, and they're already over six years old. <laughs> what type of seizure is when the body is jerking, foaming at the mouth, but the child is rendered unconscious? Now, when you're reading, you're going to see that there's different sort of seizures, you know, febrile. But this is the most common. When you think of a seizure, this is what you think of. And this is your tonic clonic. And again, how do we as nurses treat? Again, turn them on their side, pad the side rails, you know, make sure their airway is clear, have suction there ready to go in case we need it. And of course, timing it. And what did the um, seizures look like? After a fall, what assessment would be considered a neurological emergency? Kid was on the second story, just sitting outside, and he slipped down the roof and fell on his head. What is neurological? If there's too much vomiting. Well, when we do neurovascular signs, okay, we look at pupils. If we see one pupil different, especially a fixed dilated, that dilated pupil, we call them in the nursing medical world, a blown pupil. It is dangerous. That means there's a lot of blood going on in the head. It's causing a lot of pressures and it is a absolute emergency. Most likely they need to do a craniotomy, get rid of that extra blood to give that brain a chance to basically breathe. With a patient with a head injury, the signs of increased intracranial pressure include what? What do you see? You have a head injury and the bleeding's going on, and, but it's continuing. So more and more bleeding is going on in that head. What will you see? And that's a change in the level of consciousness. You can see a child responding well at first, and then all of a sudden asking questions over and over again. And that might what be the clue is, is daddy coming? And two minutes later, so did you say daddy's coming? Or um, many times it's a sports injury um, with those 10 to 15 year olds and little league, et cetera. And they slid into third, well, was I safe? Or did I win the game? Did I win the game? You're gonna hear it repeatedly. That is that increased level, the decrease in the level of consciousness. That's usually what you hear first, that forgetfulness, that amnesia. What notable sign may indicate increased intracranial pressure in an infant? Now, infants are different, okay? They're unique and special. That's why I just love infants so much. When you see a child that has a neuro problem, an infant, you will know. And it's this high pitched cry. You walk into a nursery, um, the newborn ICU, and one kid is crying this high pitched cry, you go, that kid is neuro. And they're very, very difficult to calm down. They um, are gonna continue to cry. And it's like nails on a chalkboard cry. It's a really high pierced. And that's infants up to about one years old. All the following increased cranial pressure except what? So we need to know that if we're taking care of a child who has some sort of head injury or something in the brain, we need to know what will increase it. So it doesn't matter the heart rate at all. Um, turning the patient, 
coughing, suctioning, you know, if the child is intubated, we got to be careful. I mean, we have to be very, you know, scarce with the amount of suctioning we do. We don't need to overdo anything because we don't want to increase that pressure because it's going to increase bleeding in the brain. Which of the following signs and symptoms are more common in children than adults following a head trauma? You know, kids can fall down and get these big bumps on their head and it's like nothing. And then another kid can get that same lump on their head like this kid here. And it's that nausea and vomiting. Adults do not vomit as much. I mean, very rare. Children do. Children bump their head. They're going to complain of headache that's getting, you know, feeling bad. And then they're going to start nauseous and they're going to start vomiting. And that's true signs of head injury. In adults, you just might have a headache, but you're not going to have that nausea and vomiting like you do in children. What medication can be used for a child with cerebral edema due to a fall? Well, what medications do you know that treat cerebral edema? Cerebral edema, what is it? It's extra fluid in the brain. What takes care of extra fluid in the brain? Do you see how I ripped that question apart? Well, specific to head is mannitol, okay? Mannitol is specific to brain. Furosemide, not as specific. That's more peripheral um, or pulmonary uh, fluid, but specific to head, is mannitol, okay? And there's all those precautions, put it through a filter, look for crystals, can't have crystals, etc. but it works well. It really pulls the fluid out and you see it with that increased urine output. Ray syndrome, what's that? We briefly mentioned it when we talked about Kawasaki. So Ray syndrome is from aspirin. It's metabolic and it's in children. Um, we do not give aspirin to children unless they have Kawasaki disease. And that's a very closely monitored situation. Febrile seizures usually occur in, what did I say? So febrile seizures, six months, about six years old, and then they usually grow out of them. Childhood hypopituitarism results in which condition? Hypo means not enough pituitary gland. Remember there's an anterior and posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland um, works with growth. If it is hypo, it's not enough. If it's hyper, it's gigantism. That means too much. You'll see very tall, eight foot tall children if we don't take care of that pituitary, which would be a surgical removal. How would you describe precocious puberty? Precocious puberty. We know that puberty starts in children and we know about what ages it usually starts. But when you say precocious puberty, it's just really early. These could be six-year-olds who are starting to get their period and they're starting to grow breasts. And we can suspend that. We can stop them from going through puberty at that time. Um, it, to have a six or seven-year-old that has breasts that child's gonna be teased like crazy. And uh, a lot of other things could happen because of that. So um, with many of these, we try to suspend it. Congenital hypothyroidism. Which means why? Why do they have it at birth? 
And it's actually girls more than boys. It has to do with mom and their iron dye levels. And we know hypothyroidism helps with good cognition. One of the ways, if we have no understanding or idea that this child could possibly be hypothyroid is constipation, which means no stools within a day or day and a half after birth. Didn't we hear that also with cystic fibrosis? It'd be the two things that we're going to check for with that infant who doesn't stool, you know, within the day, day and a half after they're born. What acid-base alteration would you see in a diabetic child with Kussmaul's respiration? Well, let's look at this carefully. Kussmaul respiration is when you're in severe diabetic acidosis. What is acidosis? Your pH is very low. So Kussmaul's respiration is basically the response to try to correct that metabolic acidosis, the respiration slow down and it causes respiratory alkalosis. The body's trying to compensate for the metabolic inside. Okay, just think about it. Diabetic ketoacidosis, so that it's metabolic. The lungs have a chance to try to help. So what they do is try to perform um, and give alkaline out. And they do that by slowing the breast and long breaths. That's Kussmaul's respiration. What is hypothyroidism? Hypothyroidism is when the thyroid gland does not put out what it needs. This is needed for growth. This is needed for cognition. You're going to see definite delays in this child if it is not corrected. A multi-select. What would a child with Cushing syndrome look like? Well, we're talking about adrenal glands here, or we're talking about exogenous uh, or steroids that we give due to conditions, whether it be uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus, they give steroids every day to them. And what happens is these children blow up, big face, humpback, ruddy cheeks, striaea, hair growth in places you don't wanna know about. I mean, chinny chin chin little kids with hair, um, but they're not gonna look skinny at all. They're gonna be big and round. Cushing syndrome can be reversed once you remove and taper those steroids off. Seizures in children most often are the result of what? So most common type of seizures. Remember, febrile seizures is that abrupt rise in temperature from zero to a temperature in 20 minutes. And that says the brain goes, I don't understand, and it has a seizure. An autoimmune disease of the thyroid gland, you usually see it in girls in that, you know, late school age, adolescent time. My daughter-in-law has this, and she has to monitor her thyroid levels so closely. It is autoimmune. She's immunosuppressed then, and it's called Hashimoto's disease. There's no cure for it, and you do not remove this uh, thyroid. It's something which is treated with medication. Surgery is not an option. Addison's disease. Another adrenal. <clears throat> so when you think of adrenal gland, think about cortisol and aldosterone. Cortisol is exogenous or steroids the body produces for itself. And aldosterone 
is part of that. And when we see Addison's, it's not enough. So the opposite, Cushing's too much. So those are the two uh, sides of the spectrum with adrenal issues, too much, too little. A multi-select, a ventricular peritoneal shunt. And the ventricle they're talking about is the fourth ventricle in the brain. And this is a really good picture of where the catheter sits. It sits like in that little butterfly area. So in children, some infants are born and their cerebral spinal fluid doesn't drain properly and their heads blow up called hydrocephalus. With hydrocephalus, you're gonna see that big round fontanelles when they're at rest sitting up. It's just showing too much fluid. You're gonna see the scalp veins come out of them. And these kids will have that neuro cry, that high pitched cry. So we put in a ventricular peritoneal shunt or a VP shunt, and it goes up into the brain behind the ear, comes down, and it drains that fluid down into the abdomen. So what assessments are we going to do for ventricular peritoneal shunt? We're going to be measuring head circumferences uh, every shift and abdominal um, uh, circumferences. And one of the things about these shunts, we do nothing, do not touch. You will see a bump behind their ear and the physicians, neurosurgeons can pump it. But as nurses, you leave that alone because you could cause a lot of damage if too much fluid is removed. A common side of Graves' disease includes blank or protrusion of the eyes. Graves' disease is another word for what? Has to do with too much thyroid in there and these eyeballs, exophthalmus, they pop out of the eyes. Um, once we correct the hormone, there's also medications today that we can get those things and see the commercial with the lady with the sunglasses that she doesn't remove. And finally, you can see, all right, the eyes have come down a little bit. Exophthalmus, big bulgy eyes. A multi-select. What are signs of hyperparathyroidism? Well, what does the parathyroid regulate? The parathyroid and too much parathyroid gives that body too much calcium. Hypo is not enough. Well, what does calcium do to the body? I've always said, when you think of calcium and magnesium, think of muscle contractions, okay? Calcium, magnesium. When you think of too much, think of muscle contractions, um, which can cause the tingling in the muscles and unequal gait and falling over and cramping in the muscles. This is too much calcium magnesium, okay? The parathyroid has to do with the calcium, the magnesium and the hormone, the parathyroid hormone level. And these are things you would see if too much of those were in the body, okay? So remember parathyroid, calcium, think magnesium, think muscles. A multi-select. Hypoparathyroidism has symptoms of tetanic muscle contractions and what? So when you think of um, tetanic muscle contractions, that means hypo, not enough calcium. So you're going to see those muscles um, not working well, and they're really weak. They're not cramping and spasming and causing pain. And the opposite of hyper is low calcium levels. How do you treat this? Of course, it's just giving calcium to these uh, patients, these children. What does the parathyroid hormone do? Here we go. <clears throat> After all those explanations, this should be easy.
and it has to do with regulation of calcium levels in the blood. Very good. Which of the following might be a cause of adrenal crisis? Addisonian crisis, that means too much adrenal hormones are being thrown in. What are the adrenal hormones? Think of it, cortisol, aldosterone, it's just being spewed. And it has to do with the body not understanding that you were giving some sort of oral or IV steroids and you stopped it suddenly. It's what causes an adrenal crisis when you stop them too quick. As in any steroids, they must be tapered off. It's the safest way to prevent that. And it's hypertension and chest tightness. It doesn't feel well at all. A multi-select. Congenital hypoplasia, parent teaching should include. Now this is one of these really uh, different um, sort of diagnoses in the newborn child. And um, this is when the hormone which dictates, are you a boy or a girl, is confused. So these children might have a penis and a vagina or an enlarged clitoris and um, scrotum. I've seen one of these children and literally what they needed to do was number one, figure out, are you a boy or a girl? Now they'll always be infertile. They don't have all the body parts, but they did ultrasounds and hormone testings and to try to determine what to do. And then they do reconstructive surgery, but they're gonna need cortisol, aldosterone replacements. They need to tell, is it a boy or a girl? Can you imagine having a baby born? Did you have a boy or a girl? And you go, uh, I don't know. It, that's very confusing for parents. Nurses need to be very aware of that and give them support. What causes type one diabetes? <clears throat> Too much sugar. So if the beta cells in the pancreas aren't working, it's the body's fighting against it. So it's an autoimmune and immunosuppressive disease. And there's nothing there to eat up the carbohydrates in the body. There's no insulin, there's nothing. So sugar sits there and your blood sugars go up because it's not used. What statement about a pheochromocytoma is correct? It's an adrenal gland, tumor. Usually these um, children, even adults, they'll be complaining of feeling that their heart rate just goes up. They feel it sputtering and they get dizzy. And it's a catecholamine producing, which is what? Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up. And it's intermittent, so they need to catch it. They usually put these children and adults on a cardiac monitor, 24-hour monitor, because they want to see when it goes up and down, and then they'll be looking for it. With a patient with a pheochromocytoma, make sure you're monitoring those blood pressures and heart rate, because that's what happens, and that's when they feel bad. What action should the nurse implement in the care of a patient with a pheochromocytoma? <clears throat> oh, so we're monitoring blood pressures with that child, like I just said, and the heart rate also. A multi-select. Nursing care of the unconscious child should include, as I said, it doesn't matter if your child is an adult or a child, unconscious patients all deserve the same sort of um, care. We know it's turning and positioning and making sure you put, you know, pads under them that keep them dry. Um, unconscious means they're not alert. We've got problems in the head. So 
neuro signs every two hour. Absolutely. Uh, vital signs. We're going to be checking temperatures also because we know temperature does affect um, a child with uh, problems with uh, usually head injuries and always anything with the head, always be concerned of intake and output very, very closely watched. Pain control, not as closely as your neuro signs. Yes, do they still have pain? Yes, they can. Many of these children are placed on sedation to keep them calm too. Symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA, what are you gonna see? Well, diabetic means sugar. Ketoacidosis means that there's ketones being spewed. So what are you going to see? Fruity breath? It smells like a rotten peach, a rotten peach. We have doors that used to close in our ER rooms and you would see a DKA child come in, put in the room, you open the door and it's like rotten peaches hit your face. You'll never forget it. Um, you'll also test the urines. It will be ketones and of course, blood sugars. Now, why? Let me tell you why. In diabetes, there's no insulin to be able to digest sugar. So the sugar floats around in there. So your blood sugars are elevated, but the body's hungry and it can't eat sugar. So what does it do? It says, hello, proteins. I'm going to start eating you. The byproduct of protein digestion is ketones. Therefore, ketonuria, and the ketones are spilled. And the fruity breath, again, you're so much sugar in you, you're spewing it out of your lungs. I hope that made sense to you. Diabetic ketoacidosis is caused by, I just basically said that, in other words, The lack of insulin, which can't digest sugars and carbohydrates. So the body says, you know, I need something. So the other fuels are protein and fat. So it goes right for the proteins. A diabetic child's complaining of feeling jittery. Blood sugar is 45. What's the best treatment for this child? The key words here is the child is complaining of feeling jittery. So what's the treatment? So give them orange juice, give them a glass of milk. Both of those things are good. Again, reading the question says complaining. That means they're alert enough to talk to you. They don't need to be getting glucagon or D5W or D50 or anything. Um, so this one can take something orally. They're talking. Your patient has experienced a head injury. What would most concern you? Think of head injury and swelling in the brain. When you think of the brain, you think of that pituitary gland that's getting squished and it's saying you're an output down. Therefore, this would be what you would see. And with head injury, with decreasing urinary output, what would be a good thing to be able to get rid of that fluid? Manitol. A multi-select. What would alert you that a child's head injury is deteriorating? <clears throat> Well, you know, head injuries are going to be headaches and they're going to be nausea, but it's going to be progressing. The big thing is when the child becomes restless. It's something's going on, either getting confused or getting restless. That's what children do. And then it gets to the point of unable to arouse, up foundation, you know, it goes through those stages of it. So it is restless and arousal, your big ones here. 
a child's been diagnosed with bacterial meningitis, what is the nursing priority of care? What's the one thing you need to make your priority when you are giving nursing care to a child who has bacterial meningitis? And that's the antibiotics because that's what's going to cure it. You know, most of the time, meningitis is viral. And then it's just Tylenol and Motrin and monitoring fluid balances. What is the primary cause of injury associated with submersion? We've been talking about um, drowning. We talked about it last week. Child goes under, bottom of the pool. What's the biggest thing you're concerned about? And they have fluid in their lungs, they're not breathing, so it's hypoxia. And hypoxia is the biggest injury that's involved with it. A multi-select. Which CSF lab value correlates with bacterial meningitis diagnosis? Your cerebral spinal fluid, they've done a tap now. They have sent it to the lab and it looks like that cloudy stuff right there. When you see a cloudy milking like, milky looking liquid coming out of cerebral spinal fluid, it's trouble. And what you'll see is an elevated protein with a low glucose. They, the bacteria eats the glucose up, so it's low. And what's left over is that protein. So that's what you will see. Hyperfunction of the pituitary gland in adolescence results in what? Last question. You know, hyperpituitarism is usually a cancer or tumor on the pituitary gland and they go up through the nose and they're able to remove it that way. But if we allow these children and, and do nothing, these are gonna be the eight foot tall people that we've seen in you know movies and et cetera. Good old Frankenstein movies. Sean, number three, good job. Number two, Kristen. Number one, doo -doo 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 -doo. Ashley, good job, Ash. Number four. Didi and Mackenzie, good job, guys. What I want you to do is sign your attendance attestations. Thank you for staying and getting rid of it. The rest of it, I was actually pretty good. It was only three minutes late. Good for me. Thank you, guys. I'll get you your exam scores as soon as I possibly can. Thank I, you. I, I think Thank you. you got everything you need out Thank of that you. chapter. Thank do I have to um, text you for it or are you just going to send it? Just send me a message. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>